Hello, you guys. What is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I am your host of Killer Instinct. Before we get started, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. And I know right about now is when I tell you we post weekly on the podcast every Wednesday and then again every Thursday on YouTube. However, we are switching it up a little bit. So let me tell you how this new schedule is going to work. So typically you guys are used to getting the podcast version on Wednesdays and then the video version on Thursdays. However, all Killer Instinct content is now going to be posted on Wednesdays, which means you're going to get the podcast and the video on Wednesdays. And then Thursdays is going to be where you're going to get all the content for my new podcast, My Thoughts Exactly. So Killer Instinct is gonna be Wednesdays. My Thoughts Exactly is going to be Thursdays. But now let's move on to the reason we are all here, which is to discuss today's horrific case. I know last week in the Tory Stafford case, I gave you guys a disclaimer saying that we were going to be talking about the horrific murder of a child. And I also feel the need to give you a disclaimer here as well. The case we're going to be discussing today is 100% horrific, and I wanted to let you guys know beforehand as a disclaimer, we are going to be talking about the murder of a pregnant woman, as well as the murder of a newborn child. And so if that is not something that you can stomach, that is completely understandable, don't worry, and I will see you in the next one. But if you want to stick around, let's jump right on into it. So today we are talking about Reagan Hancock. Reagan was born on November 14th of 1998 in Hope, Arkansas. So she actually just had her birthday not too long ago, about a week ago at this point. She was born to her parents, Jessica and Brandon, and her parents did not stay together for very long after she was born. However, Reagan had a very very close bond with her family. She was one of several siblings. She had a blended family on her mom's side and her dad's side because both of them ended up entering new relationships after they split up. Now, everyone who knew Reagan said that she was an incredibly joyous person. She had an incredibly kind heart. Her mom, Jessica, said that Reagan was the type of person where if she trusted you and cared about you, she loved you with her entire heart. And she was super close with her mom. They talked every single day. They always said good morning to each other and good night to each other, just sending each other text messages throughout the day. Reagan was also a member of the church in Louisville, Arkansas, and she had a job working as a customer service representative. In September of 2019, Reagan married a man named Homer Hancock, and the two of them had a very loving relationship. They met when they were teenagers and got engaged in July of 2019. And at that point, they had already had their first daughter and their engagement was really cute. Their daughter was wearing a shirt that said, mommy, will you marry daddy? So it was just a very beautiful moment for their family. Reagan and Homer had the type of relationship where they were constantly posting each other on social media and showing each other off. They would post pictures together and write these incredible love note captions, just saying how much they appreciated one another. And like I said, they also had a daughter together. They had a three-year-old daughter at the time where this all occurred named Kinley. Being a mom was her favorite thing in the entire world. She had such a close relationship with Kinley and absolutely loved being a mom. It was like the thing that she was most proud of in the world. And she just loved the relationship that she had with her daughter. So as you can imagine, Reagan and Homer were over the moon to find out that they were expecting another daughter that was set to be born in November of the year 2020. And at this time in their lives, Reagan, Homer, and Kinley were all living in New Boston, Texas, as they awaited the arrival for their newest daughter, who they had already named Braxlyn Sage. Now, Reagan was a very loving and kind girl. We've gone over this. And because of her infectious personality, she had a ton of friends. And one of those friends was a woman named Taylor Parker. Taylor and Reagan had met through social media and Taylor had actually taken the engagement and wedding pictures. Taylor herself had two children from her first ex-husband named Tommy Waycasey. 
However, after her second child, Taylor had to have a tubal litigation in 2014 and then a medically necessary hysterectomy in 2015. Now, if you're unfamiliar, a hysterectomy is a procedure where the doctor essentially removes your entire uterus. And so after this procedure is done, it means that the person who got the procedure can no longer get pregnant. I'm sure there's a lot more that goes into it. I'm not a doctor, but that is just the basic overview of what happens after that procedure. And again, it was something that was medically necessary for Taylor at that time. Now, according to Tommy, Taylor's ex-husband, Taylor was absolutely devastated after she had to have this procedure done because she had two sons at the time and she desperately wanted a daughter. And after the birth of their second son is when Tommy and Taylor's relationship began to go downhill. As you can imagine, this type of procedure really heavily impacted Taylor, especially because she wanted to have more kids. So the impact of that, also with the fact that Taylor was a notorious liar, did not help their relationship. And ultimately, their relationship came to an end. Now, after divorcing Tommy, Taylor met another man named Hunter Parker, who she ended up marrying. Now, according to Hunter, he said that Taylor never informed him that she wasn't able to have children. He also said that oftentimes she would fake a variety of medical problems. And according to Hunter, Taylor oftentimes faked seizures in order to gain sympathy from Hunter and in turn to keep him in the relationship and to keep the relationship stronger. At least that's what she thought she was doing. So anytime they would go through a rough patch or an argument, Taylor would throw out that she had some medical condition or she would fake that she was very sick or like he said, fake a seizure in order to disregard the problem that they were going through and to gain sympathy for herself. And Taylor was not only lying to the men that she was dating, she was also lying to her friends. When Taylor informed her friends that she was infertile, she did not say that it was because she had a hysterectomy, but rather because she was diagnosed with uterine cancer, something that was not true. She would fake stories about how she had miscarried with twins or that she had a stillbirth with her daughter. She was constantly making up stories to try and get people to feel bad for her. That is the basis of all of this. And there were no records for anything that she was ever stating. And not that you need to be able to prove that these things happen to you because it is a very personal thing. It is a very personal decision. However, Taylor had a deep history of pathologically lying to the people that were close to her. And her lies didn't just consist of medical conditions or infertility. Her lies went way beyond that, which we will get to in a little bit, but she would lie about anything and everything. And it was because of the series of lies that her and Hunter's marriage ended in April of 2019. Now, just a few weeks after Taylor's second marriage had ended, Taylor went on to meet a man named Wade Griffin. Wade was a roofing company supervisor who claims that his relationship with Taylor was an emotional roller coaster from the very beginning. According to Wade's friends and family, they said that everyone who was close to him could tell from the beginning that the relationship was not as serious to Wade as it appeared to be to Taylor. And just as she did time and time again, Taylor lied to Wade from the get-go. Taylor had actually told Wade that she herself was an heiress and that him and her were going to purchase a $4.5 million walnut farm together for the two of them. However, as time went on and Taylor realized that she needed to somehow make this lie go away, she told Wade that her mother had stolen all of her inheritance and hired a hitman to kill her and Wade. How does that story really make sense? I don't know, but that is the basis of what she told him. Now, in order to mask that insane story that she made up, Taylor needed to come up with another lie, and that is exactly what she did. In January of 2020, Taylor told Wade that she was pregnant and that her due date was September 22nd, 2020. And let me remind you, Taylor had her hysterectomy in 2015. Now at that point, similar to Hunter, Wade had no idea that Taylor had a hysterectomy. 
Which, let me just interject here and say something. I think it's important to note that you're not required to disclose your medical information to someone that you had recently met or disclose that you had this procedure that would make you infertile to someone that you're newly dating. However, the issue here, and I feel like we can all agree on this, is that Taylor was lying and saying that she could get pregnant and that she was pregnant when that quite literally was impossible. And she knew that it was impossible. Now again, Wade had no idea that Taylor had had this procedure done, and in his mind, he wasn't even thinking that that could be a possibility, obviously. That's really not something that would come to your mind at first. But what Wade thought is that he believed that this was a ploy by Taylor to basically trap him into a relationship. Now, where this is taking place is all a pretty small town, and this is somewhere where everyone knows everyone, and when Hunter, Taylor's second ex-husband, found out that Wade and Taylor were dating, Hunter actually reached out to Wade's younger brother. When Hunter reached out to Wade's younger brother, he warned him, saying to basically watch out for Taylor, and that she would always come up with all of these crazy lies and medical conditions and was known to fake pregnancies. Now this was one month before Taylor had decided to announce that she was pregnant. And when Wade's younger brother heard this, he decided to go to their mom first. He went and told his mom, Connie, about this conversation. And Connie, who was extremely concerned at the time, brought it up to Wade. However, when she told Wade this, Wade got very upset and defensive and just figured that his family was trying to break up his relationship. Now, when Wade first brought Taylor around his family and Connie started to get to know Taylor a little bit more, Connie said that she had a lot of red flags about Taylor from the beginning. And the first and biggest one to her was the fact that Taylor did not have custody of her other two children. And the worries only began to rise when Wade would confide in Connie about some interesting things regarding Taylor's pregnancy and wanted to know if they were normal or not. For example, Taylor had announced her pregnancy in January of 2020 and stated that her due date was in September of 2020. However, something Wade noticed is that Taylor did not start showing in her pregnancy until August of 2020, so only one month before the due date. Now, when Wade was explaining this to his mom, he said that the reason for this, from what Taylor told him, was because Taylor had a tummy tuck surgery years prior, and because of that tummy tuck surgery, she was not going to show in her pregnancy like quote unquote normal. Obviously, there's a bunch of different ranges on a scale of how women show throughout their pregnancy. However, this whole excuse about the tummy tuck thing was just not real. And Connie explained to Wade that that was not something that would normally happen. And the following day after that conversation, Connie received a text from Taylor saying not to believe what Hunter had told Wade's younger brother because Hunter was just a jealous ex-husband who was mad that he didn't get any of Taylor's inheritance. Connie also mentioned how it always felt like Taylor was in a competition. Taylor had conveniently announced her pregnancy only one month after Wade's younger brother and his wife had announced their pregnancy. So she just thought it felt like Taylor was always trying to one up everyone around her. Now you might be sitting here thinking that this could all be very easily disproven if Wade would just go to a doctor's appointment, go to an ultrasound and see that there was no viable pregnancy at that time. However, you do have to remember the time frame of all of this. This was in the peak of COVID 2020. And as you may remember, during that time, there were a lot of rules and regulations, obviously, however, especially in doctor's offices and hospitals. And the rules were really for most places that only one person was allowed in the room when it came to ultrasound appointments and things like that. And that one person was the mother. So it's not like Wade was intentionally trying to miss these appointments on purpose and being negligent about it. He quite literally just wasn't allowed to be there. And when Wade did try and take it a step further and call the clinics to get information about Taylor and the pregnancy and all of that, the clinics would say that it was under HIPAA protocol to not give Wade any of Taylor's information. 
And if you're unfamiliar, HIPAA basically just protects patient privacy and it makes it so doctors can't just go around and tell your personal information to everyone and anyone. And Taylor made this pregnancy very, very believable. She faked urine tests and reused her old sonograms from her first two pregnancies to show Wade to try and prove that she was having a baby. She also ordered a fake baby bump in August of 2020 and fake sonograms to show Wade over time. And again, August of 2020 is when those concerns started to arise for Wade about why Taylor wasn't showing in her pregnancy, so she went ahead and bought a fake baby bump. Taylor even had her own gender reveal to show that she was going to be having a daughter. Now, when Taylor's first husband, Tommy, got word of all of this, he decided to anonymously text Wade over the course of several days. And these text messages basically consisted of Tommy telling Wade that Taylor had had a hysterectomy and there was no way that she could possibly be pregnant. He said, quote, I'm reaching out to you because I feel like it's the ethical thing to do. In 2015, Taylor had a hysterectomy. She is not pregnant. She can't get pregnant. She is a con artist and is lying to keep you around, end quote. And at this point, Wade didn't know what to believe. He has Taylor telling him one thing and then is hearing a bunch of different information from everyone else. So he decided to screenshot these texts and send it to Taylor. Now, obviously they were anonymous, but Taylor had an idea that it was probably one of her ex-husbands. So she just told him not to worry about it, that everyone else was just lying to him because they were so jealous of what he had with Taylor. And simultaneously, while Taylor is sitting there trying to assure Wade, that everything is fine. Nothing is wrong. She's pregnant. It's all good. Taylor was simultaneously Googling videos of how to perform a C-section. On September 30th of 2020, so eight days after Taylor's presumed due date, Taylor was seen at a clinic in Paris, Texas. She had checked in as a new patient, so this would be the first time she was at this clinic. A receptionist at the clinic saw Taylor crying in the lobby while she was filling out paperwork, and when she asked what was wrong, Taylor told her that her husband, who she marked in the paperwork as Wade Griffin, had recently passed away in the military and that she was too emotional to be there that day and asked to reschedule. Now, Wade is not in the military, nor is he dead. So this was a very bizarre situation, and it was another one of Taylor's lies. However, what made this situation even more bizarre was that later that day, after her scheduled appointment that she had rescheduled, Taylor was seen in the parking lot of this clinic looking at the license plate numbers of the women who had arrived to have their own ultrasounds for their own pregnancies. Now, typically what happens when you get pregnant and your baby hasn't been born by a specific date, you usually get induced. And Taylor knew that that was going to have to happen at some point. And so she told Wade that her induction date was October 6th. However, the night before that on October 5th, strangely enough, there was an intentional fire set in Wade and Taylor's home that caused the plumbing and the power to both be knocked out. And not only that, there was also a bomb threat. And not only that, there was a bomb threat to the clinic that Taylor was set to go to the next day to be induced at. And when police looked into where this bomb threat came from, they linked it back to Taylor. Taylor had called the bomb threat so she would not have to go in the next day to get induced. Taylor Parker was not pregnant at this time. I know we keep alluding to that, but I think it's important to state it as fact. Taylor Parker was not pregnant. And so this all brings us to October 8th of 2020. And that whole day and in the days prior, Taylor had been texting Reagan Hancock. Taylor had told Reagan that she had a baby gift that she wanted to give to her. And remember, Reagan also thinks that Taylor is pregnant too. However, little did she know that the woman that she thought was her friend had something much more diabolical in mind. What Reagan didn't know is that Taylor had scoured the internet looking for expectant mothers in the area that were having a girl. And that's when she came across the girl who was already her friend, Reagan. 
And when Taylor found out that Reagan was having a girl, she tried to become as close of friends with Reagan as possible. And while Reagan thought that this was just a sweet gesture by Taylor, little did she know that this was all just a part of Taylor's diabolical plan. If you've ever had unprotected sex, forgot your birth control, had a condom break, or you're just not sure, I'm excited to talk to you guys about a new company that is giving emergency contraception a much needed rebrand. Julie is an FDA approved morning after pill that helps stop pregnancy before it starts. It works best when taken right away or within 72 hours of unprotected sex. And Julie really is aiming to be the emergency contraception company for the next generation, one of learning and acceptance, not of stigma and shame. And when it comes to the complex and stressful choices around your health, Julie believes that women deserve products that are easy in every way. That means easy to find, easy to take, easy to relate to, and easy to understand. You can find Julie at Walmarts all across the U.S., or you can order online for the future, just in case. You can go right now to juliecare.co to learn more or find Julie at your nearest Walmart today. That's juliecare.co to learn more. The holidays always seem to be the most stressful time of the year, but this year, there's no need to stress. Take a break instead of worrying about what to get those impossible to shop for family members. Dadgrass has something for everyone, including your most loved furry friends. Take the edge off and enjoy the season. Dadgrass is legal, organic, smokable hemp that relaxes your body and mellows your mind. Their 100% organic pre-rolled joints, tinctures, and gummies are very low in THC and high in CBD, so you can enjoy the effects of CBD while keeping a clear head. And Dadgrass didn't forget the pets. They also have released CBD dog bones, so everyone in the house can enjoy. All Dadgrass products are federally legal for ages 18 and over and shipping right to your door anywhere in the U.S. Right now, Dadgrass is offering our listeners 20% off your first order when you go to dadgrass.com slash killer. Go to dadgrass.com slash killer for 20% off your first order. That's dadgrass.com slash killer. On the night of October 8th, Taylor had gone over to Reagan's house at around 7.45 p.m. to give her this gift. Now, Reagan's husband, Homer, was also home at the time, and he remembers Reagan and Taylor just sitting at the kitchen table talking while he was in the living room watching TV. Taylor then left that night, and Homer and Reagan went to bed. The next morning on October 9th, Homer left for work early, leaving Reagan and their three-year-old daughter at home. Now, police were able to figure out that Taylor had bought gas that morning at around 6.35 a.m. near Reagan's home. Reagan and Taylor exchanged a number of text messages between 7.22 and 7.52 a.m., and Reagan was also texting Homer all the way up until 8.30 a.m., Now, looking back, Homer said that Reagan was not texting him the way that she usually would. However, he just chalked it up to maybe her not feeling well or her just being really tired. I mean, she was eight months pregnant, so there's a bunch of different things that could be going on. However, Homer started to worry a little bit when he received a message from a neighbor of his telling him that their family dog had escaped from the home and was roaming around the yard. That message got to Homer at around 9.15 a.m. on October 9th, and that is when Homer repeatedly started texting Reagan and calling her. However, he wasn't getting a response. Now again, with her being eight months pregnant and with Kinley being in the house, he started to get a little bit worried, and that is when he decided to start calling some of Reagan's family and friends friends to see if anyone could go over and check on her. Now, Reagan's mom, Jessica, worked closest to where Reagan and Homer lived, so she told Homer that she would go over and just make sure that everything was okay. However, when Jessica arrived to Reagan and Homer's home, she was horrified to find her daughter lying on the living room floor and her body completely mutilated. Jessica called 911 just after 10 a.m. screaming and told them that her daughter was dead and that there was blood everywhere. Jessica said that when she walked up to the front door, she saw a bloody fingerprint on the doorknob. She used her shirt to open the doorknob and when she walked into the house, she saw a bloody shoe print on the kitchen floor. 
Jessica said the first thing that she noticed was how Reagan's blonde hair was now bright red due to all of the blood. Jessica said, quote, I knew from all of the blood that she was gone. I think I screamed because I didn't know what to do. I fell to my knees and then called 911, end quote. Now, Reagan's stepdad was the second person to arrive at the house. And when he walked in and saw Jessica, another thought clicked in his mind. And that was, where is Kinley? So at that point, Jessica and Reagan's stepdad start looking around the house for Kinley before ultimately finding her sleeping in her bed. Now, luckily, she was unharmed physically. However, that obviously means that she was there throughout the entirety of her mom's attack. So Jessica and Reagan's stepdad arrived to the house before police did, and Homer arrived shortly after that. However, when he did, police would not let him inside, and he had tried to run in and see Reagan and see what was going on. However, everyone knew that it would be better if he did not see his wife in that state. Now, when the medical examiner arrived on the scene, they were able to piece together that Reagan had been beaten in several different areas throughout the home before eventually dying in the living room. Reagan had countless defensive wounds on her hands and her arms. She also had five skull fractures, a broken nose, and over a hundred stab wounds. It was believed that she was stabbed with a scalpel that was found inside of her neck. Now what the medical examiner and police realized very quickly is that there was someone very important missing in this case, and that was baby Braxlin. Reagan's lower abdomen had been cut open and Braxlin as well as the placenta were gone. So whoever killed Reagan also kidnapped Braxlin. Now, coincidentally enough, at 9.36 a.m. that same day, so about a little over 30 minutes before Jessica found Reagan, Taylor is seen driving erratically by police in Idabel, Texas, and police began following her and eventually pulled her over. Now, while Taylor was being followed by the police, she actually called 911 and said, quote, I have a state trooper behind me and I'm going to need an ambulance because I started having my baby. I need an ambulance to get to Idabel. That's where my doctor is. I'm parked on the side of the road, end quote. And ironically enough, the same 911 operator that took that call from Taylor is the same one that got the call from Reagan's mom about 30 minutes later. Now, when police started approaching Taylor's car, they said, quote, the driver was waving out the window. I could hear a female voice on a 911 call. I asked her what's wrong, and I could see a newborn baby with the umbilical cord attached on her lap. She told me she just had a baby and was trying to get to the hospital in Idabel, end quote. Now, the officer said that while he approached Taylor's car, she was crying and had blood all over her, on her face, on her clothes, on her shoes. However, he chalked that up to her just having a baby because why wouldn't he believe her at that point? Taylor told police that she was shopping at a Walmart in New Boston, which is where Reagan lived, in that she started to feel pressure while she was shopping. And she said that by the time she got back to her car, she delivered the baby. Now, an ambulance finally arrived and they started driving towards the hospital. And while in the ambulance, EMT workers heard Taylor say, quote unquote, she's all over me. Now, at the time, they assumed that Taylor was referring to the baby However, what we now know is that she was referring to Reagan and the blood that was all over her. Now, Taylor was very specific from the beginning about the hospital that she wanted to go to. She said that she needed to be taken to Idabel because that is where her doctor was. However, EMTs advised her to go to the closer hospital because clearly the baby needed attention immediately. However, Taylor was adamant that even though it was farther away, she wanted to go to Idabel. So that's what they did. So now switching gears, when police are at Reagan's house and realize that Braxlin was missing, they put out 
an alert. And that is when they learned that not too long prior, there was an infant reported for cardiac arrest. And that was just, like I said, about an hour prior to authorities finding Reagan. Now, at first, police didn't think much of it, but then the pieces started to fall together. Police said, quote, it's more than enough for me to realize these things were connected. So I called the new Boston police department, but someone else had already made the connection and were on their way to Idabel, end quote. Now, when Taylor got to Idabel, doctors started to look at her and look at the baby and give them medical attention. And there were a couple red flags right off the bat. First off, they noticed that the amniotic fluid that was on Braxlin was dry and flaky, which signaled to them that this was not a baby that had just been born. This was a baby that was born several hours prior, not several minutes, as Taylor was saying. Now, when Braxlin was first brought to the hospital, she was not breathing and there was no pulse. IVs were given to her and CPR was performed. And throughout all of this, nurses remember Taylor not having any signs that she had been in active labor recently. They said that when they checked her uterus, it did not feel like a normal uterus for a woman who had just given birth. There was also no active bleeding and blood tests showed that she had no evidence of pregnancy hormones. Now, along with all of the medical inconsistencies, nurses also noticed from an emotional standpoint, Taylor was not exhibiting the same signs as someone would who just had a baby. She seemed very closed off, very cold, and it definitely made nurses and doctors in that hospital suspicious because they couldn't figure out at that time why Taylor was acting so off. Now, unfortunately, Braxlin was deprived of oxygen for too long and had suffered extensive brain damage. She was taken off life support and declared dead at 1.22 p.m. on October 9th of 2020. Now, police knew that due to the inconsistencies in Taylor's story, along with the fact that they had a mother who has been brutally murdered and whose baby has been quite literally ripped away from her. And then they have a woman in a town just over from her with a newborn baby who's acting suspicious, who's refusing testing. There were just too many rare events that were happening in too close of a time frame for it not to be related. Police finally decided to do DNA testing on Braxlin, and that was when they were able to figure out pretty quickly that Taylor was not the biological mother of this baby. And while they were able to exclude Taylor, they were also able to figure out that this baby belonged to Reagan. This is when they put the pieces together and figured out that Taylor was responsible for Reagan and now Braxlin's murder. Taylor Parker was later arrested that day on October 9th of 2020 in Idabel, Oklahoma for kidnapping and murder. Now, at first, Taylor did admit to this. However, she claimed that this is what Reagan wanted. She claimed that earlier that morning, she went over to Reagan's house and that there was a physical altercation between her and Reagan. She said that Reagan pushed Taylor to the ground and she said that during this altercation, Reagan was injured and in turn asked Taylor to cut her baby out of her because she wanted her baby to live. Now, this story obviously all went out the window when police started doing some more digging into Taylor's social media and realized that she was faking a pregnancy for at this point 10 months. They realized that this was all a part of Taylor's master plan and that she had diabolically set Reagan up in order to kidnap her baby and claim it as her own. Police found all of the evidence that Taylor was trying to hide, including deleted conversations between her and Reagan on Facebook. And then they figured out that Taylor had unfriended Reagan and Homer just days leading up to the murders. They also figured out that Taylor had a burner phone, and that is when they discovered all of the bomb threats that were happening at the clinics. And Taylor's gig was pretty much up at this point. Now, Taylor was charged with murder and kidnapping in this case, and it actually went to trial. Now, during the trial, 
They spoke of everything that I just told you today. And after about an hour of deliberations, a jury found Taylor Parker guilty of capital murder in the deaths of a Reagan and Braxlin. And Taylor Parker has since been sentenced to death as of November 10th of 2022. So she just got sentenced to death about at the time that I'm filming this eight days ago. So she will never be released and she has received the death penalty for what she has done. Now, like I said in the very beginning, this is a whirlwind of a case. It is so incredibly heartbreaking and tragic for everyone in Reagan's family and for all parties involved. In the blink of an eye, this family's entire world turned upside down. Reagan's daughter now has to grow up without a mother and a sister. And Braxlin lost every chance at life before it even started. And this is just a terribly heartbreaking case. However, I do believe that justice was served in this one. And the fact that Taylor will never be able to walk out of prison again, I think is the least of what she deserves. So with that being said, you guys, that is this case for today. And that is all for me today. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of Killer Instinct. Again, if you are new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I'm your host of Killer Instinct. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post Wednesdays on the podcast and on YouTube, and you're not going to want to miss it. I'll be back next week with a brand new case for you guys. And until then, stay safe. Bye guys. Bye guys.